Today, we are so excited to present um, David Gwynn. He is a librarian, urbanist, and retail historian at UNCG. He's also the creator of Grosseteria. Grosseteria. <laughs> Grosseteria. Thought I could get that right. One of the first and largest websites devoted to supermarket history. David has prepared for us a look back at the history of grocery stores here in High Point over roughly the last hundred years. Being that we have a hundred years to cover, I'm going to let him get started. So help me welcome David Gwynn. Thank you, uh, Mike. Working okay, I hope. Uh, I'm glad to see y'all. So many people came out to actually hear about supermarket history because you think it's kind of a weird thing and a lot of people are not necessarily going to be interested in it. But also if you think about it, it's a thing that everybody does and a place that everybody goes pretty much at least once a week um, unless you're doing that Instacart thing. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, and that's kind of why I'm interested in it because it, you know, it is an everyday thing and I think you know a lot of cases in history, we go with the big monumental buildings and the big monumental events, and we don't pay as much attention to things that people do every day or buildings that people visit every day. Um, so that's, that's my official justification, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so the plan for today is, first up, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and why I'm here. I won't bore you with that for terribly long, though, because um, then a quick overview of sort of the, the history of groceries in the 20th century nationwide. And then I'm going to focus, kind of zoom in on the triad, some of the chains that you might be familiar with uh, in the local area. And I do focus pretty much exclusively on chains. I say chains around the country. So uh, you might not hear so much about the independent stores you may have shopped in because the chains are my area. But sometimes I can speak independent too. So, um, and then a QA and a if you have questions, uh, and I'll try to make up answers to them if I don't know an actual <laughs> true answer. So. Um, so who am I? Well, my name's David. Um, I'm a triad native. I was born and raised in Greensboro, uh, in the southwest part of Greensboro. And, uh, but I also lived in Charlotte for four years and San Francisco for 13 years. And San Francisco was where I started the website, but we'll get there in a second. Uh, I am a librarian at UNC Greensboro. I'm in charge of the unit that actually digitizes historical material and puts it online. So, you know, I get to actually get paid to do history too, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm very much an urban obsessive. I visit cities. Cities are the things I like. And that plays into this a lot because what I'm interested in is the way cities develop over time spatially uh, and how they come to have the form that they have now. And, you know, I'm big on what used to be where, and that kind of thing. So, and I travel a lot. I also, as we mentioned, started grossateria.com, and where the name came from, we'll get to in a minute too. So don't don't stress over that. Um, where did it start? Well, it all started with snuff, as all good things do, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, a lot of people ask about how I got interested in this, and you know, years ago, my, my mom lived, you know, as a lot of people did in the Depression, with her grandmother. Uh, she lived on a library base place in Greensboro, which was right around the corner from the first A&P supermarket in Greensboro. Now, A&P had been there for years, but this was their first supermarket. And my mom used to have to walk over to the A&P and buy snuff for her grandmother. And she'd tell me about this later on because by the time I came along, my grandmother was in her 80s, and she, or my great grandmother was in her 80s, and she was bedridden. And my mom still had to go to the AMP and buy her snuff um, because the AMP was the only place that, stole, that sold her brand, which was Railroad Mills Sweet Scotch snuff, which apparently you can still buy. I had no idea. Um, you can buy it at Sam's Club online if anybody's looking for some. But, um, but we have to. My mom hated hated the AMP. She thought uh, she thought they were old and overpriced and expensive and dirty. Uh, my mom was a Best Way, Buy Right, and Kroger shopper. But um, but we always had to stop in at the AMP to get it. It's not for my great grandmother. And the one we had to stop that often because it was on the way it was the one downtown Greensboro on Commerce Place. And I started getting readers really obsessed with this old store, which um, wasn't really, it was only 26 years old at the time, but that seemed ancient in those days, which, you know, a 26 year old supermarket is not that big a deal now, but um, it seemed ancient back then. So 
I started getting obsessed with these old stores, etc. Um, then I became an artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my supermarket series from eight-year-old me. Um, it's never been exhibited anywhere. So <laughs> it's been seen online in a cases, why. but this is the first time it's actually been seen in a museum setting. So. <laughs> <laughs> I drew a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, I became sort of obsessed with old stores, etc. And then uh, you know, later on in San Francisco, um, I got bored one weekend. I think it was, it was Fourth of July weekend, actually. And in San Francisco, the big chain is Safeway Stores, which is a national chain, but they're very dominant in San Francisco. They had an incredible store prototype that I think I've got a picture of somewhere later that I was really interested in. And I started doing research to find out where all those were, because I just wanted to take pictures of them, because, well, that's what I did. Uh, but that led into a lot more research, a lot more research, and uh, it became a hobby and then a website. And after a while, you know, I was using so many digitized historical resources to do this project, I thought, you know, maybe this is what I want to be when I grow up. And, uh, that's when, you know, after having moved back to the triad in 2006, um, I went to library school and became a librarian who digitizes old stuff, and I've been sort of ecstatically happy ever since. But that's me. You don't want to hear about me anymore. But um, I will sell signed prints of the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a quick overview of sort of the grocery history of America. Um, We'll skip the 1800s because, well, they weren't here. Um, <laughs> they don't really. But the chains, uh, which is what I study, uh, to start with, with, with the grocery industry, you have to understand that the margin is incredibly low on groceries. I mean, you know, 5 to 10% markup is the high end of the scale. A lot of, a lot of supermarkets actually sell much, a lot of their product below cost with the idea of getting you in the store so that you buy a few things that are above cost too. So it's very important to keep cost control down and that's sort of affected the way stores have developed over the years. Um, the first part of the 20th century, we were looking at really small stores, um, even the chain stores. And uh, as we talk about the development of the supermarket, people think the supermarket and chains and self-service all sort of were the same big development, but they were actually three separate developments that kind of merged. Uh, the chains, even in the early days, were really small. As you can see, this one from High Point, uh, this was a Pender's store that opened in the 20s, and you know, it was smaller than the average convenience store, even, and the one down here was a National, which was later a Big Bear. You know, they were tiny, they had counter service. You walked up to the counter and asked for what you wanted. You didn't go grabbing stuff off shelves. You, there was a person who ran the store. Uh, stores that were called grocery stores often didn't have any meat or produce. You went to a butcher or a green grocer or a farmer's market or whatever for your meat and your produce. Uh, the idea behind the chains though is that to keep costs down, they were cash and carry. So you actually came in, you paid cash, you didn't run up a monthly tab and they weren't gonna deliver it to you. That was sort of the big dramatic transformation that the chains brought to the industry. Uh, and the chains you see here, we'll talk more about both of those chains a little bit later down in the show. So the big chain that everybody associates with the groceries is the A&P. I bet there's nobody in here that hasn't heard of the A&P or the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. It was established in 1859 and it was established as a tea company. That's all they sold. They had stores in New York City and they sold tea. They imported it, they packaged it, they sold it. Then they branched out to other, what we call dry groceries, so spices, things like flour. Um, and ultimately, um, they started selling other products. What we would probably, what, what the grocery industry now calls center store, it's the stuff in the middle that doesn't require any refrigeration, all the prepackaged stuff. Now, A&P's big innovation in the early 1910s was the economy store, which was a, uh, a very small store that they replicated uh, eventually about 16,000 times around the USA. Uh, they were small, they were designed to be one or two man operations, and I say that because they really were just men. They didn't hire women at this point. 
Um, so it was a one or two man operation. They had short leases, so they were able to say, okay, this location's not working, we're gonna close it and move across the street. There was no capital expense, nothing. These were just little donkey stores. As you can see, um, well, as you will see in a minute. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, the Kroger chain opened in Cincinnati in 1883. Um, Acme Stores or American Stores uh, in the Philadelphia area was one of the largest chains that opened in the late 1800s. Safeway Stores, which became a national chain, started two-pronged in uh, Los Angeles in 1911 and in American Falls, Idaho, a town which apparently, which I did research on, doesn't really exist anymore because they built a dam and flooded the whole town and moved it about a mile away. Um, so you can't go to the first Safeway anymore. Um, they started in 1915. In 1916, there was Piggly Wiggly. Talk about them in a minute, too. Um, the next big development on the way to the supermarket was self-service. Um, and I said, we talk about Piggly Wiggly in a minute? We're going to talk about Piggly Wiggly. I, I will tell you, too, there's about to be a really great book published on the history of Piggly Wiggly by a colleague of mine at UNC Greensboro buy it when it comes out. Um, we'll be doing a present, there will be a presentation in Greensboro that uh, I just found out last night when it comes out, it's a new book. So. Um, Self-service though, were still small stores. They still didn't have a lot of perishables, if they had any. Um, Self-service though was able to <coughs> kind of grow with the development of branded products. So, um, you know, brand name stuff. And um, because, you know, have the, the pull to grab, say, I'll grab a can of this or a can of that or whatever. Um, the Piggly Wiggly was established in Memphis by 19, in 1916 by a man named Clarence Saunders. Uh, it was the first self-service system to be patented. They had their first triad store opened in Greensboro in 1919. Uh, they were in Winston-Salem and High Point by the mid-20s. Um, and there's, Piggly Wiggly's a whole interesting other history that I won't get into here. Their founder went bankrupt and was pushed out of his own company. And in spite, he started his own chain, which was called Clarence Saunders Stores, sole owner of my name. <laughs> <laughs> an interesting guy. Um, there's a museum to him. And, uh, and you could place. actually patent the design of the layout of the store. You could it? indeed, and he has, many patents for the Piggly Wiggly system. It was a whole turnstile operation. You had to go through the full turnstile, but it was still a tiny little store, as you can see. You had to go through it, and they even had chain link fences on either side to keep you from <laughs> leaving with stuff. Uh, and most of them looked like that early on. Piggly Wiggly was kind of like Aldi, too. It was a very low cost thing, but it got really trendy for middle and upper income shoppers, too, sort of the way Aldi has. Um, so they started locating in higher end neighborhoods in a lot of cities. But Piggly Wiggly was interesting too because it was a franchise, it wasn't a chain. So you bought the rights to use the Piggly Wiggly name in a certain area. So they were owned by a lot of different uh, entities. Uh, Alpha Beta was another early pioneer in self-service. They were based in Orange County, California, and established in 1917. And their big trick was that they arranged the groceries alphabetically throughout the store, which, <laughs> It's an interesting thought. It doesn't really work too well in practice. And yeah, now it's a small store. So it uh, doesn't take you too long to get from A to Z, really. Um, but Piggly Wiggly and Alpha Beta arguably were the first two big pioneers of self-service. There were tons of other chains that claimed to have invented self-service or to have invented the supermarket. And it's a pretty valid chain because of uh, claim, because people were coming up with this idea all at the same time. Yes, sir. Was it alphabetically by brand name or by product? <laughs> by product, I believe, because there weren't as many brand names in 1917. So you'd have, I don't know, eggs, something that starts with F that's not a perishable. Um, flour. 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 <laughs> um, then, I don't know, gardenia seeds. Like I'm having trouble with my letters today. It looks like they sold in the Campbell soup. <laughs> they did, yeah. There were, I mean, there were some branded products, but I think the alphabet the alphabetical nature was by the product type. 
Yes, sir. Yes. interesting is this NRA here, that's the National Recovery Act. Yeah, clearly this is a photo is not really from 1924. I'm starting to say. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for noticing that so that I can fix that later. <laughs> We better um, add a 10 to that yeah. too. I mean, another one. Alpha Beta did become a big supermarket chain and, and, and all over California later on too. So a lot of these early chains actually you know, got bigger. Um, so the next big development was what was called the combination store. Now in this case, this was um, stores that, you know, that had the standard grocery line, but they also started having some perishables in a lot of cases, they would expand the store and break through the wall to the next store because these were all little storefront locations with no parking out front. I think downtown or streetcar strips, that kind of thing. They would bust through and maybe license a butcher shop to a local to a local butcher who would then you know actually handle the meat, et cetera, too. And they became known as combination stores. You see Piggly Wiggly here from. Uh, I think this is sometime in the 20s in Greensboro bragging that we now actually have some produce. Uh, and over here, the first meat market in Greensboro, which was I think about 1928, or A&P, was the first chain to actually open a meat market and sell meats within its store as well. Um, that led to a lot of store expansions. Uh, and But just to get a feeling for how little and how kind of ubiquitous these stores were, these are the three big chains in High Point in 1935. Um, in 1935, there were 10 A&P stores in High Point. There were nine national food stores that would later become Big Bear. Get there in a minute. Uh, and there were five tender stores. So there were, um, that makes 24, 24 big chain stores. Right. Oak Hill Grocery. Yeah. I'm old enough that we shopped in there. Right. <laughs> uh, think about comparatively. Now there are currently about ten full service supermarkets in High Point, and at most maybe two or three of them. High Point's a much bigger city now, and maybe two or three of those serve the same area that these 24 chain stores in 1935 had. So there were tiny stores and they were everywhere. Why? Because people walked to them or took transit. You went to the store every day or two, you picked up what you could walk home with or take home with you on the streetcar, etc. So they were close to where people lived. They were all over the place. Um, most of the old line chains like Safeway AP hit their peak number of stores in the early 1930s and it's been downhill ever since for all of them. Not because their sales went down, but because they started consolidating into bigger and bigger stores over time. Um, then came the supermarket. You could argue that Ralph's in Southern California was the first supermarket chain because they had huge stores that had different concessions, meat and produce. But what most people argue is the first supermarket were the King Cullen stores in New York in the New York area. Now supermarkets were a part of the uh, aspect of the depression basically they came along with the fact that more people had cars more people had refrigeration and the supermarkets themselves had refrigeration but they were still very urban stores and a lot of these stores were just open in old warehouses or garages like this they were hideous I maybe mean, these were junky awful stores but they had dirt cheap groceries. They also leased out departments along the perimeter. So they would lease out an area to someone selling meat. They'd lease out an area to someone selling fresh produce, um, maybe even clothes, all kinds of stuff. They have everything in these stores. And they, they looked pretty bad. The chains were not doing this either. This was completely small independence and little chains that came up with this innovation. The chains hated them. Um, and they thought it was a fad, it's never gonna last. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, inside, that's an attractive display, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you're big on flour. Um, but the, this is from actually the Big Star, which was the first, which was the first supermarket in Greensboro. Um, but they were, they were kind of dumpy until the chains came in, which started happening when A&P came in, in the, in the late 30s. It started sort of sanitizing them and prettying them up a little bit. So, um, and then came the suburban and modernization era. Um, this is 
some of my favorite stores because I'm into the whole mid-century thing. But um, first up, you see a Metro. This is in Toronto, but there were a lot of different chains that used a variation on that design, like Safeway, all over the country, Pen Fruit in uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, Grand <laughs> Union, which actually this was originally a Grand Union. And then a Safeway store in Lodi, California. I took that picture in 1993 because I just drove by it and said, ah, that's amazing. Um, it was long before I was doing the site or any of this research. I just thought that store was so incredible. It's still there, but it's been painted over and it's not the same anymore. But we started seeing bigger stores and bigger parking lots or parking lots at all. Uh, suburban shopping centers that might have one or two supermarket anchors. Um, the one right down the street here is a Colonial something. Uh, I used to have a Kroger and something else as one of its anchors. Uh, we also started seeing the first super stores, which had, you know, like a discount department store and groceries all in the same place. This actually predated Walmart by decades, but, you know, there were stores like Kmart had its own grocery departments. They were usually run by other chains. Uh, Clark's department stores, J.M. Field, Jimco. And we started seeing really big shopping centers like Friendly Center and Thruway and smaller ones. Um, the modern stores in the 50s kind of got more homey in the 60s and 70s, and we call those the beige years. <laughs> um, we'll see that a little bit later on. So uh, you might recognize this sort of, but not recognize it entirely. This was what was planned for a site on Westchester Drive in High Point in 1964. It was a big outdoor strip shopping center with a Kroger at one end, an A&P at the other, and a Clark's discount department store in the middle. This would later become this, which many of you may have known as Westchester Mall, which was actually the first enclosed mall in the triad, opened in 1970. Uh, but it did still have an A&P and a Kroger in the parking lot when it finally opened. Really? It wanted either end. The A&P was where there's a drugstore now, like a Rite Aid or a Walgreens. The, uh, the Kroger has been torn down and is underneath that big retirement community that's there now. I love this mall because the J.C. Penney, the old J.C. Penney store is the sanctuary of that church, <laughs> where I used to get shoes every year. Um, it, it was actually really common for malls in the early years to have supermarkets, but they don't so much anymore. And the ones here didn't last very long either. When I remember that, down here at this end was Tallheimer's. Right. At that end was Penny's, and mm -hmm. the middle was Belk's, and right. then the K and W cafeteria was in there. It was right, yeah, the K and W was right by Penny's, and the mall, the supermarkets were in two outbuildings on either end, closer to the front. Um, all right. Well, now that we've had sort of a little overview of how it happened nationwide, let's uh. <coughs> I'm probably running tighter on time than I want to be at this point, so I'm going to flip through these really fast. Let's talk about the triad a little bit. Uh, that's High Point 1969 in the background, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so the AMP. Let's talk a little more about the AMP right now. Again, it was established in New York City in 1859 as a tea merchant. For most of the 20th century, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company was the largest retailer in the U.S. and thus probably the largest retailer in the world. Uh, they had stores in America and Canada at the time. Uh, they entered the triad, their first store in Greensboro, which you see right here, was in 1910. Um, this is from one of the Greensboro historic or pictorial books that's held by the Greensboro History Museum. Um, they uh, entered the triad, like I said, in 1910, and they were in High Point, Winston-Salem by 1920 as well. Um, this is an example of one of the economy stores I talked about. It's one of the small, small stores. Uh, this was next to a fire station on Ashboro Street in Greensboro. Uh, the fire station's still there, but the a has been torn down now. Again, they were small and they relocated frequently. Um, interestingly enough, you know, as we talk about food deserts now, these stores did serve every neighborhood in the city, though. So even the poorer neighborhoods, their stores might have been maybe not quite as nice in the poorer neighborhoods, or maybe there weren't quite as many of them. But this one, for example, um, was on the edge of the Warnersville neighborhood, which was an African-American suburb in Greensboro, um, at what was called Five Points then, but isn't called Five Points anymore because five streets don't converge there anymore. 
Um, and there's a convenience store with a McDonald's there right now, which makes me very sad. But, um, but they did serve all areas of the city at that time, or better maybe than happens in some cases now. Uh, again, the peak store count happened in 1931 at about 16,000 small neighborhood stores. Uh, by 1941, AMP only had 6,000 stores. Now, uh, obviously, some of those probably were a function of the Depression, but most of that was due to consolidation and the larger stores. By 1951, uh, they only had 4,500 stores, but their sales were three times as high, which means they were doing fine. They were just doing it in bigger stores at that point. Uh, AMP was very much a chain innovator on the supermarket. Unfortunately, it was one of the last things they were an innovator on, which is what kind of what led to their demise. Um, this is a, an AMP economy store list in Salem, by the way. So, AMP began operating supermarkets in the mid 1930s, and by 1938, they had 1,100 supermarkets that had replaced countless stores. One supermarket right replaced five stores five little stores. The first one in Greensboro opened in an old tobacco barn on Commerce Place downtown in 1938. Um, you see right here, and it burned down in 1946. This was the store where my mother bought snuff for my great grandmother. Um, they lived right across the street from the library, which was right across the street at the time. Um, so yeah, this, is, this one's a special store, and you can see the inside looked kind of like a barn, because it was. Um, and that's, you know, even, even with the chains, that's what supermarkets looked like at the time. But again, that one burned down in 1946 and became this bit of loveliness. Um, this one's very important to me, again, because this is the store that sort of got me obsessed with old supermarkets. So uh, it was ultra modern. And the cool thing is, as I found out recently, the Greensboro History Museum has a collection of amazing interior photographs of this store from right when it first opened. Uh, it's hard, it's really hard to find exterior photos of early supermarkets, but it's dang nigh impossible to find interior photos of stores from the street. But you're going to see a lot right now. Uh, I'm going to be respectfully silent as I <laughs> Eight o'clock coffee, anybody? <laughs> there he is. I never think about weight. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember why I left it or not. Uh, yeah, the next one you'll see. Um, you can sort of tell this was from the grand opening because usually you wouldn't have a big flower arrangement <laughs> at your, <laughs> your butcher shop. Usually. Um, you can tell this is grand opening just because the produce looks so neat. <laughs> it obviously had been arranged for opening day. I've been in supermarket grand openings before and their produce departments all look like this on day one and never look like it again. <laughs> and I really love the, the floating fresh candy <laughs> right in the middle of the store. Um, Um, so uh, again, at this point, the supermarkets, even when we think of them as in the suburban, so suburban things, they were usually located right downtown as well. This is on Liberty Street in Winston Salem. Uh, this one's been torn down. It's where I think where the new, where the transit center is in Winston Salem right now. Um, so they were pretty much dead up downtown. As you can see, this one probably had a pretty tiny parking lot too. Um, uh, and even up to the 1950s in Greensboro, there were still two A&P stores and two Colonial stores in the downtown area, which was pretty amazing and is unusual for a city even larger than Greensboro. So it was um, pretty hot. Um, uh, they started moving a little further out. Uh, grand openings were a big deal. Yeah, you might give away TVs or cars or whatever special sections in the paper when stores have their grand openings. Uh, this is the A&P on Gate City Boulevard, or now, or what was called Lee Street at the time in Greensboro. This is now a U-Haul dealership, um, which is cool, because they have a picture of the, U-Haul uh, recycles a lot of old supermarkets, and in a lot of cases they have pictures of the original building on the front of the store, which is kind of cool. Uh, high Point, 
um, from the same era. There were two, these are two stores that were in High Point. Uh, they're both still standing. Both have been very heavily modified. One on top is on uh, North Main Street. I think it's a family dollar now. And the one at the bottom is actually still selling groceries, though it's been subdivided. Uh, I really like that because it's like the one in Greensboro that has those angled glass windows on the front, which are really cool. I had a better picture of this that I couldn't find, so that's a Google Street View shot, um, which is why it doesn't look all that good. Um, but AMP uh, at this point was not moving out very far from downtown, um, and this was great now, and you'd think it's an urbanist dream now. In the 50s, it was starting to become a little bit of a problem for them, though. Um, this is what a lot of people think of when they think about AMP. The stores that look like this. Uh, it was called the Centennial Prototype because it was unveiled in connection with their Centennial in 1959. Um, there are hundreds, hundreds of these around the country that are still standing. They've proved to be very adaptable buildings. Uh, I've seen them reused for everything from supermarkets to drugstores to dentist offices to schools to churches. You can put anything in one of these, and it usually works pretty well. And they actually still had fairly good locations as well. Um, and there's even a couple in Canada, so they're very rare out there. Um, they always catch my eye, and I always stop and shoot a picture of one when I drive by one. Uh, there is still this one on Centennial Street in High Point, uh, still standing, still selling groceries under another name up until about, I don't know, 15 years ago. It still had a lot of elements of its original interior, but it's been sort of redone since then. Um, here's the grand opening of that store. Uh, Greensboro had one of these two. It's on Battleground Avenue, and it's now Fleet Plumber Hardware. Um, grand openings, like I said, were a big deal with valuable free prizes. Because <laughs> um, you just can't beat that a &P. And uh, this is not the High Point store, but this is a pretty good color representation of what it would have looked like when it first opened. I think this is one in Atlanta, actually. Uh, AP was getting a little more colorful with its interiors at this point, too. This is peak late 60s for me. <coughs> um, the deli shop and the garden fresh and the meat department. Um, this is from a progressive grocer magazine spread uh, of AP stores around the country. Um, the Dairy Den, Jane Parker. Jane Parker, I don't remember Jane Parker. That was the baked goods in AMP. Uh, I had an uncle who was obsessed with Jane Parker fruit cakes. And after AMP left the South, every time I would go north to where they still had AMPs, he'd make sure I came back with a carload of them. <laughs> well, it's just great, they lasted forever. <laughs> um, but, you know, AMP had some problems, though. Again, they were located, they had old stores that were located in inner cities in a lot of cases, and it was hard to keep those stores profitable. And things started going downhill in the late 60s, early 70s, particularly after the, uh, the sons of the original founder died and the company sort of went astray <laughs> or wasn't modernizing or wasn't updating and reinvesting in its stores. Uh, they had two big meltdowns. Um, <laughs> in 1973 and 1975, which started a death spiral, which carried on for about 40 years until the company finally went defunct about eight years ago. Um, this one's my snuff store again. I was very sad, it closed in 1973. I was kind of young at the time, so I wasn't really all that sad. But, um, <laughs> it was only 26 years old, which actually seemed ancient for a supermarket then, but it doesn't now, because. Supermarkets have changed a lot less in the last 25 years than they did in the preceding 25 years, for example. You could still walk into a 1996 supermarket, feel pretty comfortable and know your way around, but in 1975, a 1945 supermarket looked pretty darn ancient because, you know, they're more modern now. And it started spreading. They closed and closed and closed and closed, and A&P closed over 1,500 of its 3,500 stores in 1975, so more than a third of the company. Uh, AMP left the triad in 1983 after a brief effort to reposition itself. Uh, they closed all the AMP stores, and in Greensboro and Winston, they opened these big new things called family marts, which actually had some general merchandise in them, you know, some clothes and some towels, not many, but um, you know, it was sort of a grocery store with with more stuff, which is kind of standard today. Um, they didn't do very well though, and they sold those both to Kroger in 1983. So that's A&P. 
Um, Byright and Bestway, any of y'all remember Byright and Bestway? Um, so Byright was established in Greensboro in 1955 as a co-op. And so it wasn't really a chain. It was a bunch of independent stores that sort of banded together to do purchasing and advertising uh, to sort of save money and keep prices down so they could compete with the chains. They did all adopt the buy right name, um, and the, the co-op was largely headed by a man named Bob Butler, who owns Butler's in the uh, Glenwood neighborhood of Greensboro. Incidentally, that was located in what used to be an a &P. Um, Byright became a big chain in Greensboro in the 60s and early 70s. They were one of the big ones. That's where my mom shopped. She loved Byright um, until she came to love Kroger when it moved closer. But, um, Butler, however, uh, sort of developed his own chain within the co-op. So he owned six stores within this co-op that was maybe 12. And he branched off and left the co-op around in the early 70s uh, to found what was called the Best Way chain. <laughs> so that's where you see a lot of stores that used to be by right that became Best Way. Uh, ultimately opened in High Point and some other surrounding towns. Uh, and High Point, uh, there was one on South Main Street uh, that was recently torn down for a new Aldi. Uh, and their thing was discount prices without discount treatment. My mom loved Best Way. Um, that's why it didn't last. <laughs> in 1985, they filed bankruptcy. Uh, the Byright Co-op sort of filed, folded around the same time. Uh, Bob Butler had acquired a store on Battleground Avenue that used to be a Kroger, and it nearly broke him, apparently, and broke the whole chain. Uh, it was bigger and fancier, and it just didn't work for them. There is one Byright store left in Stokesdale. Um, it's not part of the chain. It recently relocated to a new building. It's owned by a gentleman named David Wren, who has an incredible butcher, by the way. Um, but um, as you can see, that's the... Is that about right? The, the one left is in Stokesdale? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, and Bestway, uh, there is a still store still under the Bestway name in Greensboro. It's not by the original owners, but um, it's the only one left today. It was, that was originally an A&P, by the way and later a buy right, and up until about 20, 15, 10, 15 years ago, it still had its pretty much original 1960 interior inside. Um, but yeah, there's not really a chain anymore there. Um, and again, I hope I'm okay on time, because I've still got a little ways to go here. Uh, when you start getting bored, everybody just start yawning. Uh, this one's the one that High Point's gonna love, which is National Food, Big Bear, and Food World. Now, that's kind of High Point's own success story. It was established by George Hutchins in the 1920s. Uh, they originally operated as national food stores, and its base was at 100, the 100 block of West Washington Street, which I think more recently was Kivett Drive and now Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Um, it became a pretty large local chain of the small neighborhood stores that were big at the time. Um, but then about 1938, he expanded the downtown location, which is no longer standing, unfortunately, into a Big Bear supermarket. He started using the name Big Bear. And uh, eventually the other stores followed. Some of them were expanded or converted. Some of them were replaced. Some of the small stores <laughs> stayed open. They called them Little Bear. <coughs> um, this is how the logo evolved over time. Um, the chain eventually reached as far south as Ashboro, which is where this is still standing. I don't know if that sign's original or not. It's on an antique store, but that originally was a Big Bear supermarket. Okay. Um, and as far north as Danville, Virginia. Um, and a couple of former locations in High Point. This is one on English Road where uh, one gentleman has already informed me he remembers shopping this uh, at. Um, it's now a church. This is one on North Main Street. Not the first one. Not the first one. Right, this one was, uh, this is I think a 50s era store. The first one is long gone, unfortunately. I think there's a bank building there now. So, um, then in 1954, the chain expanded into Greensboro with a store on Lawndale Drive. Um, just still standing, it was still a supermarket up until maybe the early 90s. Um, and it's a Habitat for Humanity store now. Um, and, uh, <coughs> opening. Uh, it was a drugstore for years, too. So. Uh, they also opened in Greensboro in what used to be the Proximity Mill Mercantile Store, 
um, in one of the Cone Mill villages. Uh, that one didn't last very long. It was replaced by another store a couple of years later. And in Winston-Salem, um, they opened stores and then also purchased a local chain called Stop and Shop in Winston-Salem and converted those as well. This one is also no longer standing. It was at uh, Patterson Avenue and Liberty Street in Winston. Um, this was First Street and Hawthorne Road in Winston. Uh, this one was originally an A&P. Later became a food fair and at some point a Pier 1. <laughs> <laughs> so Big Bear started modernizing again and moving into shopping centers. Um, and this is the one in Greensboro that the, the Cone Mill store moved into at Northeast Shopping Center. This store has housed a supermarket continuously for 63 years now. It is, uh, started out as Big Bear, became a Harris Teeter when the company was acquired and is now a Compare Foods. <laughs> That's, that's, that's some history. Uh, this is a store on, next to King's Department Store on West Market Street. They opened a lot of stores next to King's Department Stores. Then for some reason around 1971, the stores began converting to the Food World name. I don't quite understand why. It might have been they were uh, planning to expand into an area that already had Big Bear stores, which was common at the time. Um, or they could have been disassociating themselves from a lot of older, smaller stores that were closing about that time. Um, at this point, Food World became the predominant brand. My mom continued to love Best Way. My dad loved Food World because they had the deli and the bakery. He was, he was into the deli bakery. So they called it the deli kitchen and the Danish pastry shop, as I remember. Um, this was a brand new store in what is now in High Point Mall in 1975. I think this is, on one end, it's like a Marshalls or a TJ Maxx or something. Now, at the other end was a Winn-Dixie. They're both gone now. And there's a Harris Teeter in the middle between where the two used to be, where the mall used to be. Um, and this one was a former Kroger right near my house off High Point Road in Greensboro. Um, in 1985, though, or they closed. There were no more Food Worlds because in 1984, Food World was acquired by the Ruddick Corporation, uh, which also owned Harris Teeter Supermarkets based in Charlotte, and the two chains were merged together. Uh, Harris Teeter just started opening stores in the triad, so it seemed like a likely combination. So basically, ultimately, all the Food World stores became Harris Teeter, and uh, the Food World name was gone by 1985. All right, uh, Pender's Clothes. This is a pet chain of mine. This is always been one of my favorite ones, uh, but I'll try not to talk too much about it, because, uh, anyway. Uh, the David Pender Grocery Company, established in Norfolk in 1901. Uh, the store you see right here was in downtown Thomasville. Uh, I don't think it's still standing. But um, they were known for their yellow front stores, even though this one doesn't have a yellow front anymore. This was the first store in the triad. This was in Greensboro in 1923. Um, in, 19, in the 1930s, at some point, they merged with a chain called Rogers Stores in Atlanta. Um, still operating under their own names to some extent, but like so many other chains, they converted to supermarkets in 1936. This was the first big star supermarket and the first supermarket in Greensboro. Opened in 1936. It was a new concept for Penders. Um, and again, thanks to the Greensboro History Museum, we have pictures. This was a, a corner of Washington and Green Streets. It's now a parking garage. Uh, this was a store I was kind of obsessed with as a, as a kid, too, because it was torn down before I was born. But there was a parking lot there originally, and you could still see the tile around where the doorway was. And my mom would take me by, and I could look at that. And so this is one of my two stores I was really obsessive with, so I was really excited that there are pictures. I'll go silent again now and be respectful of the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the Big Star store in Greensboro. I love the coat rack over there. I don't know why. Um, would you leave your coat on a coat <coughs> rack? And, uh, <laughs> the carts, which were basically baskets that were mounted on rollers at that point. And the, they started using a kind of new version of that same cart in stores. <coughs> so it's kind of cool. All right. 
High Point, Big Star, 1938. Uh, this was on South Main Street, and this building is still standing as well. Uh, this prototype was replicated all over the, the southeast, and there are several of them still standing. Uh, this is a photograph of that very same store. And um, this is the inside. It was a little smaller by now, but they, learned, they came up with a prototype that was kind of easier to replicate around the region. Um, then the interiors were a lot more standardized by this point. This is that building now. Um, there are also, the building directly to the left of it was a Kroger store, so the Kroger and the big store are right next to each other on South Main Street uh, for a good chunk of the 40s and 50s. Uh, this is a colonial store, which was originally a big store, big star, in uh, Winston-Salem. So right after the war, you all know when I say the war, I'm talking about World War II, right? <laughs> um, all, the, all the different brands came together under the Colonial Store's name. Um, this is by 1947. They were at that point running stores called Big Star, Little Star, Penders, Rogers. They all became Colonial Stores at that point, even the little ones. <clears throat> uh, they came up with a new kind of modern prototype with that weird little scaffolding sign kind of thing, which I kind of like on top. They built a lot of these around. Uh, it's, this one in particular was on Ashboro Street, now Martin Luther King Jr. Drive in Greensboro. Um, this one was on High Point Road, now Gate City Boulevard. And then uh, by the 1960s, they sort of morphed into this, I don't know, I think less interesting prototype, but a lot of these stores got converted into that look. Uh, that one's somewhere in Atlanta. <clears throat> but then came 1963, and discounting was the thing in the 60s. So uh, they resurrected the Big Star name in 1963 to put on their discount supermarkets that were sort of low frills. Uh, they didn't give trading stamps. They had everyday low prices. Um, they began operating in the triad with the Big Star stores in 1968. There's one on High Point Road in Greensboro and on Westchester Drive and High Point. Uh, most of these stores were built in centers that were anchored by Zayer department stores at the time. They had an agreement. Colonial at this point was also operating the supermarkets, a lot of the big stores like Kmart, Clark's, Richway, et cetera. So uh, they were used to being next to department stores. By the mid 70s, uh, they were all big star. Colonial was gone. Um, and this was actually a colonial store that was converted into a big star in the Atlanta area. Colonial um, only existed as the name of the company at that point. Uh, and Colonial was acquired by Grand Union Stores from New York in 1977. And that started a period of decline for them because yeah, they were basically, basically <coughs> being bled dry by their new CEO. Uh, in 1988, the chain uh, was sold off with the triad stores going like Food World had a few years ago, mostly to Harris Teeter. So the uh, big star stores became Harris Teeter, basically uh, different things in other places. So the big star is no more either. All right, quick one on Food Lion and Food Town. Uh, established in 1957 in Salisbury and is known for making a lot of millionaires in Salisbury because they just solicited people on the street saying, give us money to open a grocery store. There's a good book called Lion's Share that I recommend reading if you're really interested. Um, the Kettner family had actually owned stores before and they sold them out to Winn-Dixie in the 50s and they opened new stores and Winn-Dixie was not amused and tried to run them out of business, but um, it didn't happen. Their first High Point location opened in 1972. I think they had an earlier store in Kernersville, but uh, High Point opened in 1972 out on South Main Street. Again, recently torn down and there's an Aldi there now where that shopping center used to stand. They grew like wildfire and if many of you will remember the LFPINC, they had bumper stickers, people actually used them and put them on their cars, it was, it was crazy. I'm not gonna sing the jingle though. <laughs> um, in 1982 though, as they started moving uh, northward into other areas where there was already a pre-existing chain called Food Town, uh, they changed their name to Food Lion so that they could move into those areas. Um, it was a big deal. They had commer they did commercials at the time saying, we're saving you money by changing to a new name where we only have to change two letters on our sign. 
<laughs> their commercials were all about saving money, about recycling cardboard, and they were, and they all involved Ralph Kettner. He did all the commercials until their next CEO, Tom Smith, took over. Uh, but they changed their name to Food Lion in 1982. They were also acquired by a Dutch company, uh, Delhi's, which gave them the lion symbol in the early 70s. So they're basically the wholly owned subsidiary of this Dutch company that recently merged with, a, I'm sorry, it's a Belgian company that recently merged with a Dutch company. But that, that's getting too much into the present, so we won't go there. Uh, quick look at Kroger, established by Barney Kroger in Cincinnati in 1883. Uh, they arrived in Winston-Salem in the 30s, but not in Greensboro and High Point until the 50s. Um, this is First Street at Hawthorne Road in Winston-Salem. This is now somebody's burger bar. This is my favorite Kroger prototype. I just love that sign. Uh, this is an abandoned store on Patterson Avenue that's been torn down in Winston-Salem now. This is another version of that same Kroger. This one I refer to as the Blanche Taylor Moore Memorial Kroger. <laughs> Many of you may be familiar with Blanche. She worked in this Kroger store before poisoning a few husbands. <laughs> um, and then being well played by Elizabeth Montgomery in a TV movie. Um, so uh, the first one in, uh, or there was one at Westchester Mall in High Point. It did not last very long. Um, Kroger never had a big presence in High Point, which is why they're late in the presentation here. Uh, but they had exited High Point in the mid-1970s, but they were still open in Greenboro and Winston-Salem. They uh, unveiled what they called the Superstore prototype in the early 70s. Really colorful detour, a lot of specialty departments. Their jingle was tomorrow's store today. Kroger's got it. And it was colorful. This is peak 70s. I remember this. This was the Kroger near my house was one of these. And by the 80s, they had this new prototype, which they called the Greenhouse Prototype. Um, and they also returned to High Point at this point briefly with a store on East Chester that's, I think, a gem now. Um, the chain left the triad in 1999. They swapped out their stores here with Harris Teeter in return for a bunch of Harris Teeter stores in Virginia. So um, that means Harris Teeter had the at this point had taken over the stores from three different chains um, and has done really well with them since and has sort of become one of the dominant retailers in the area and thank them for the refreshing check and back in store as well. <laughs> I was recently in the Kroger store in Martinsville, Virginia and that's a wonderful grocery store. Yeah, um, well ironically as you know, as you probably know, Kroger now owns Harris Tea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a whole different area. Um, I end this presentation about 1985, which is why we don't talk about Harris Theater too much in general, but we do talk about Winn-Dixie, and I hope I'm not gonna offend everybody when I talk about Winn-Dixie, because my mom didn't like Winn-Dixie, and I wasn't wild about Winn-Dixie either. But um, <laughs> company became Winn-Dixie was established in Miami by the Davis family in 1925, and most of its growth was through mergers, acquisitions, <laughs> It was called Win and Love It <coughs> or, or, uh, in 1944 until they were acquired a chain called Dixie Home Stores, which was based in North and South Carolina. And that's where the Dixie and Win Dixie came from. So uh, interestingly, the store you see at the bottom right uh, was built as a Dixie Home Store and had to change its sign within a year after it opened because Win Dixie bought it out. This was on Battleground Avenue in Greensboro. Um, Win Dixie was an iconic Southern chain. It was well known for its house brands like Thrifty Made, which they got rid of a few years ago with all these incredible house brand names that everybody loved. They were also known for their broad-breasted turkeys. I, I have a friend whose mother still wants to buy broad-breasted turkey every year and is very upset that she can't down in Lumberton. Um, unfortunately, they were also known for kind of spotty service and stores that weren't maintained as well as they could have been and very inconsistent quality. When Dixie didn't know what they wanted to be, they had upscale stores, they had dumps. They were all over the map and they didn't really have a consistent branding. And I think that was the problem. 
And they had a major meltdown in 2005. They reduced their footprint in half. And now they're basically only around in Florida, South Georgia, and around the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they exited the Carolinas, Georgia, Kentucky, pretty much every place. And they eventually merged with the dregs of what were left of by those stores. And that name has gone away in the last couple of years too. So there are a lot more that I'm not going to talk about because there were too many of them. But I'll show you a couple pictures. <laughs> um, Cloverleaf. Cloverleaf, uh, I think the last, I don't know, is there still a Cloverleaf here or did the no, last one finally close? It, it, it was at the, it was on Mont Lowe at right. Hamilton. And that was a former colonial store. Right? Yeah. And the, the original Cloverleaf was actually in the Cloverleaf at where 29 crossed Main Street. And I noticed driving by there the other day, that's been torn down now because they've torn down pretty much. Looks like they're building a new interchange. Yeah, they've torn down everything there. Yeah. We had a Hannaford yeah. briefly mm -hmm. over near the uh, so called mall. Right. But it uh, left in the last one I was in was down at Raleigh. Yeah, Hannaford, uh, Hannaford left because they uh, ultimately were purchased by the company that owned Food Lion and they had to they had to divest those stores for antitrust reasons. So uh, in but in North Carolina, most of them closed, and uh, other places like Virginia Beach, Kroger bought them out, and it was sort of, and in the Triangle too, Kroger bought them out, and that was sort of their entry into the region. So, a lot of local chains. I do have a picture of the Clover Leaf. Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> um, it's a Habitat store now too, I think. Yeah, Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. Y'all may remember by Lowe's. <laughs> Columbia Food Market. Yes, that was on North Main. And the Red Dot story, which I don't know much about, but apparently there were a lot of them. I think it was a co-op kind of like buy right. So. And that's really all I got. So if you have questions, I'm up for I don't know if we have time, uh, but if you have questions, I'm up for it. Uh, other than that, thank you. <coughs> if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand and I can bring around the mic. I was told a, I was told a long time ago that the College Building Shopping Center down here mm -hmm. was the first uh, shopping center like that in North Carolina. Do you believe really that to be true? There's a couple of claims to that. I think I, I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly when that one opened. There were about there were three or four that opened right along at the same time, and that was probably one of them. There was that Friendly Center in Greensboro. Uh, Park Road Shopping Center in Charlotte and Cameron Village in Raleigh. Uh, College Village may well have opened. I don't remember exactly when they all opened right around the same time, but College Village may well have been the first. Yeah. Uh, the, the one in Raleigh was in the 50s. Yeah. The and 50s. I know Friendly Center probably was not, because it opened in 57. So it's <laughs> David, there was a Summit Avenue, you know, shopping Right. Center. It opened in 1950, I think, but it was. Uh, it was a smaller one that only had the one supermarket anchor, but um, yeah, that, Summit is, rec is recognized sort of as one of the first smaller shopping centers in the state, maybe the first. The, the thing I always uh, remember about a and is, I, and I don't know how many of you ever had it, was their Spanish bar cake, and it was a loaf, and it's been... It can't be duplicated. Sounds pretty good. It's delicious. <laughs> it is good. I would eat it. Oh, I forgot to mention too. Uh, the title of this presentation, the original title of the website was "Did You Bring Bottles?" Any of you remember that phrase? Okay, cool. <laughs> Back when soda bottles were returnable for a deposit, and the great thing about even when I was a kid is they just trust you. You'd walk up to the register and say, did you bring bottles? And you'd say yes, and they'd say, okay. Um, later on, they went to a system where they wrote you out a little ticket, but uh, I don't just think I remember. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I know this is like maybe before your research, but also a, a different uh, area, but did the Great Depression have any effect on the grocery store industries? Were the larger stores able to s scoop up the smaller stores because of the depression, or did it have no effect whatsoever 
Well, it actually had a lot of effect. Uh, again, the biggest one being the conversion to supermarkets. But yeah, there were a lot of acquisitions in the 30s, but there are a lot of complications around that too, because in the 30s was also the point where state governments started passing a lot of legislation trying to tax the chain stores out of existence. So there was a lot of pushback on chain stores in the 30s too. Uh, there was the National Tea Company, which was based in the upper Midwest, had a lot of stores in Detroit. And sort of to avoid that taxation, they reincorporated into a little 10 store, apparently reincorporated into little 10 store blocks with a separate official owner for each one to, uh, to avoid the taxing. Uh, which makes them really interesting to study in the city directories because they're all under individual names. Detroit was fun. But, um, but that was a big thing in the 30s too. There was a lot of acquisition, but a lot of pushback with taxation. Um, and by the 50s, they were being really antsy about uh, consolidation. Uh, in fact, when dixie was forced to stop growing by acquisition at some point in the 50s, he said, you can't acquire any of these stores any place you go into now. You have to start from scratch. Yes. I just I just had an anecdote about um, Big Bear that I thought I would share. Please. Um, Joe Hutchins, who was the youngest son of Mr. George Hutchins, who started the, as we all in High Point know, started um, Big Bear. Um, Joe told me that when they first went from just the sidewalk neighborhood store into the first what they call the supermarket that people came to shop but didn't know what to do with those buggies that were inside the door and so mr hutchins had to hire extra people to come in and teach the women how to use the buggy and how to go around the store and pick out their own groceries because they were used to having all the groceries done for them so I thought that, and I've always thought that was kind of interesting because we don't think about those things now, you know. Yeah, it was interesting. In the, in the UK, there was a chain called Sainsbury's, which is the big supermarket chain in the UK. They went to self-service supermarkets much later, obviously, than we did in the US. Cause, uh, but there's a lot of pushback from their customers, too, because they had some very high society customers in their stores who were not at all amused that they had to go around and pick up their own groceries. They were not happy about it, and they actually complained. So it was not universally accepted at first. That's probably the same people doing complaining about self-checkout at Walmart. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, my mother did cream stamps. I'm seeing a lot of heads going like that, and I know they, because I also remember they announced you, you have by a certain date to because they were cutting it off. And mm. <clears throat> Mom was going all over the house finding all the green stamp books. And, and I remember, and I think this is right about grocery stores, for every $10 you spent, you could pick out a plate or, mm -hmm. or, or a teacup and they, mm. all these promotional things that. I guess have been replaced by different promotional things, mainly what coupons and, right. and discount cards and all that. Fuel perks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, where where is it? It's to entice people into the stores. I know. Where do you see the enticements going in the future? <laughs> um. I wish I knew. I mean, what you're seeing a lot more of now is you having to actually pay to join up to get things like free delivery, et cetera. So you join our supermarket club and you may have to pay something to join it and we'll pick out your groceries and deliver them to you. Um, fuel perks are a big one that a lot of chains are going now. For a certain, you buy a certain number of groceries, you get cents off at related gas stations are a big one. Harris Teeter does that. Right, and Kroger does it with all lot of its other stores too. Um, and it's easier for them too because they have their own gas stations in a lot of cases. Uh, then there are other sorts of partner with another gas station chain, et cetera. A thing I remember about from that same time is when you go in and they sold encyclopedias and you could always buy the, the first volume for like 25 cents or whatever, which means there are all these houses that have like 
five different A volumes of different encyclopedias and no other books. Harris Theater has a gas station up on uh, East Chester at Steve Club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think even some of the chains actually did deliveries early on, but uh, it went on because the, the whole deal with the chains was trying to cut costs, uh, and delivery was a big cost, and accounts were a big cost because, well, imagine people didn't pay their bills. <laughs> um, by, but by the teens and the 20s, most of the chains were not doing delivery at all. Um, that was kind of the big thing with the A&P economy stores particularly. They said, we're not going to do this anymore. I know that you know when I do my research, I use city directories primarily because they're the way to do this. Phone books don't work; uh, they're not complete. And in a lot of cases, for example, in San Francisco, where Safeway was the biggest chain, Safeway had 135 stores in San Francisco in 1935. And San Francisco is not that big a city, but they didn't even have their individual stores listed in the phone book. Um, primarily in a lot of ways because they didn't want people calling to see if you deliver constantly. So. Uh, my name is Rich Pierce and uh, I want to tell you I appreciate your uh, uh, slides and everything. I went on your website and uh, okay. I grew up in San Francisco. I was born in 1940 and I started the grocery business when I was 14. There was a market called Fairway Market on 16th and Valencia, and I was a counter hopper in the meat department. The store was run by two Chinese guys. The meat department was with, uh, owned two Jewish guys called the Kessel Brothers, and I was in a Mexican neighborhood. <laughs> and that's where I learned the business. And when I came back from the military, I, I spent four years in the naval air. I came back, I was supposed to go get a job with the San Francisco Fire Department, but I could not jump out of a three-store building. So I ended up asking a job to get back into the meat business. So I got an interview with Safeway, and a gentleman by the name of Joe DeMarco interviewed me, and it was a two-year apprenticeship, and we were unionized out there, very strong and everything. And I completed my apprenticeship in one year, and I became a meat manager in a store in St. Francis Woods. It was the last San Francisco store that had a full service meat case. And then they closed that down, and then I went up to 32nd and Clement as a meat system meat manager. That was the new store when, uh, it in the when I was reading your websites. <clears throat> Petrini's is where my mother always shopped. It was run by Italian family, and they were, they were great. <laughs> absolutely. But I really appreciate you brought back a lot of memories when I was going through QFI, Lucky Stores. Uh, that was our competition. Right. And I even had the opportunity to go for three months over to uh, Maui. We opened a Safeway store over there. And that was quite an experience. Those people over there don't like to work too hard. They want to surf, they want to fish, and have fun. But anyway, I appreciate it. They want to make sure you're well stocked with toilet paper and spam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I appreciate, I appreciate your spam. Very nice. Thank you. I believe, I, I believe I've been, you have posted on my message board, and I've been meaning to talk to you, but it's been sort of a weird week or so up to this. If I'm not mistaken, then that's who you are. So I would love to talk to you at some point. And, and I went to, a, and when I came back here, it was Big Bear, then Food World, then Harris Theater. I spent 32 years with uh, Big Bear, Harris, Food World, Harris Theater. And these gentlemen here, we all work together. We all, we, and we still get together once a month and shoot the bull about the about the grocery business. <laughs> How it's changed. I mean, customer service today, and I think everybody will agree, that's the biggest change I've seen. Is customer service. Go to the store, they could care less. They don't talk to you. You could ask them questions. They don't know from that wall to the other wall. 
I, had, I went in one time and I had uh, Walmart and I wanted cube steak, uh, top brown uh, tenderized. They didn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> it really, really changed. Uh, but anyway, thank you again. Thank you. And when cube steak went over five dollars a pound, I said I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but um, do you, since all of you were from Big Bear Food World, do you know why they went with the name change from Big Bear to Food World? Something that's always baffled me. There was a Big Bear was always known for a high price. Uh -huh. Big Bear was always kind of unknown for a high price. And they, they figured that uh, going to the Food World name could change everything. And I believe the first Food World was uh, out at uh, Zayer Shop Center, Westchester. Westchester, number 30, which he worked, uh, I believe it was 69, was the first actually changed from when it was open, is that was the first one open as a food world. And then you opened Danville, which was 31, was the second one they opened in 71. And then they seemed to, they done really, really well. So so that's how they come about changing all the names, one at a time. Okay, that's part, I wouldn't want to know that for about a million years, so I'm glad <laughs> that was covered up. But. And that would have been about the same time they started building those shopping centers that all kind of looked alike in three different cities too, right? Oh, yeah. Like the one out of Five Points and the one in Sedgefield and Greensboro and uh, one across from Coliseum and Winston. I know, I know they developed those, I think they developed those centers and they all had kind of a similar look. David, do you remember when we interviewed Richard Gabriel? I do. He the textbook teacher in the truth uh, project that he, um, he used to deliver groceries at the uh, store that was, I think his father owned, uh, was over there near Bennett College. Anyway. Yeah, this was that was a that was a family-owned store in Greensboro that had kind of a neat history too, and um, I would have talked about it more, but um, we we'll sort of focus on the chains here. But um, you could do a whole other hour two three hours on the on the smaller independent stores like the Malpass stores which i don't know anything about yeah. that were here and the uh, mm -hmm. and again the red dots and the uh, mm -hmm. any other questions for david all right thank you so much david